of people who are going to be leaving early during this session. And since I'm Kathy Regan and chairing the session, my goal was to, to retain an audience for the, uh, the three great papers we have. So we're going to get started. Um, the, uh, this session is titled Special Populations kind of a mixture. So uh, I'm not going to be able to do what Jeff Lavelle did in many of the sessions of having unifying themes and pulling them together. I'm not going to try to do this. These are three different papers on topics. But one of the things that they give us the ability to do is tie back to themes that we've been talking about for the last day and a half, right? Um, and so that's a way to think about them. And I think the discussion we'll have at the end will also give people the chance to do that, particularly if you were one of the burning questions on something that you didn't get to talk about that is touched on here. We can talk, do that at the end. Um, so I want to thank the sponsors, but I'm going to be brief um, to save time. And um, the first paper that is, uh, we're going to discuss is tenure and location choice among Hispanic households. We have Rocio Sanchez Moyano. Um, who will be presenting, and um, the discussant here is Matthew Hall, right there. And this piece of uh, this paper links back really to papers even on the first panel that considered the issue of how location matters to the internal rate of return on home ownership, but in this case really focusing on Hispanic homeowners who are studied but not nearly as deeply on thinking about the racial gaps with African American and white homeowners. And in this case, it's going to look at difference, how differences in locational preferences also may contribute to differences in the homeownership rates themselves. So that's a lens that it'll take. The second uh, paper is on whether mobile homes affect wealth. And uh, that's a joint paper with Esther Sullivan, who was sadly stuck in an airport somewhere, uh, and her co-author, Brian Levy. Um, Don Ron is going to be the discussant for that one. Am I right? Yes. Um, that, this, uh, this paper considers affordable housing, a type of affordable housing that we do not know enough about at all. It is a really understudied area, and it's a particularly important area in some regions of the country for providing affordable housing. And the summary from this paper itself makes it worth reading because there are all these little factoids, for those of you who know nothing about manufactured housing, that you can use when talking about them. And it's an interesting lens on the work because it's looking at how a type of housing whether rented or owned, um, affects the accumulation of wealth. And it's really about residing in the housing from, say, age 12 through 30 years old. Uh, and it's not directly about owning the manufactured home, although that may be the, mo the major channel through which you have find the negative uh, wealth effect. And it connects to a tension that I see in this area that has been talked about, but not as directly, between wanting the housing services side of housing to be affordable, and yet, as we think about home ownership, wanting appreciation so that you garner wealth, right? And so this helps kind of bring those kind of surfacing that tension. And the third paper is Home Ownership Experiences Following Criminal Justice Contact. And Brielle Bryan is uh, going to be the, is going to present that paper. She's the author of that paper. And Lauren? Okay. Laura, <laughs> you moved. <laughs> so, just like I did. Okay, so Lauren Lenny Hansen is going to be the discussant for that. And so this last paper expands on our understanding of a much wider set of interactions with the criminal justice system that are typically considered when looking at collateral damage, and particularly in terms of <laughs> home ownership. It looks at the likelihood and duration and um, even at the timing of its onset. So it connects to several panels and discussions about barriers to, to accessing home ownership, but on a whole dimension that really has mainly not been looked at at all. So we could have had an entire another panel thinking about these barriers that are, are distinct. And so I'm going to hand it over now to Rocio, and um, I'll come to Q&A at the end. Okay, let's see. So, as I'm sure many of you in this room are familiar, the Hispanic white homeownership gap is large and is persistent through both the boom and bust period and, and throughout the growth in affordable, uh, and, and affordable credit in the 1990s. And so this homeownership gap then translates into a Hispanic white wealth gap. So homeownership is the primary form of wealth accumulation for the average American family, and the median Hispanic family has just 4% of the wealth of the median white family. 
So there is an existing literature on, on the home ownership gap, but it's really focused on one of three main uh, avenues to explain this difference. The first is financial endowments. And so this is just the fact that minority households and Hispanics in particular tend to have lower incomes, lower levels of education, less wealth. This then inhibits them from becoming homeowners. We also have a, a whole literature on life cycle effects. And so this is the fact that, that aging, that having children, that getting married are trigger events into homeownership. And so to the extent that these characteristics are distributed differently across the population, or if they act more or less strongly for some groups than others, we're going to again see these gaps at the national level. And then finally, when we're thinking about Hispanic households, it's really important to consider the immigrant experience. At the household level, Hispanics are 60% immigrants. Um, and so being a new resident to the United States might come with other residential uh, mobility because people might not know enough about the labor markets or the housing markets. You might not even know if you're going to stay in the United States. And so it's important to consider those, those characteristics as well. And so the, the main theoretical threads that I'm drawing on here are these two debates between spatial assimilation and place stratification. So spatial assimilation takes the concept that as minority households socioeconomically assimilate, <coughs> you then turn this into purchase into spatial assimilation by purchasing near white families. Place stratification counters this and says, no, look, there's something about being a minority in the United States that is going to inhibit, it's going to create a barrier to access uh, for homeownership or for residential uh, attainment broadly because of institutional barriers. So in, in most of these debates, though, geography is kind of an afterthought. Some papers do control for MSA location or for a couple of papers trying to find the effects of ethnic enclaves. But overall, it's not the sort of a leading explanation for what's going on. And actually, in both the spatial assimilation and place stratification literatures, there's an implicit assumption that homeownership is taking place in white middle class suburbs. They say it's implicit because the only way you get assimilation through homeownership is by living near the white people, which is going to be in sort of suburban and middle income areas. But I'm arguing that we actually need to start thinking more about how geography contributes to the homeownership gap beyond just that top line number. The place that a home is located is going to affect its initial purchase price, uh, affecting affordability, and the long-term wealth building potential of the home. We also know that access to capital can be really constrained by a neighborhood, and in the lead up to the foreclosure crisis, we had predatory lending really concentrated in minority and low-income neighborhoods, which then translated into higher foreclosure risk in these neighborhoods. Then beyond the sort of financial <coughs> costs and benefits to home ownership, we know that like access to schools and safety and neighborhood capital that are assumed to come with home ownership are actually going to be dependent on where that home is located. And finally, um, over the last 30 years, there's really been a shift in what the suburbs look like. Well, we have um, suburbanization, poverty, movement of minorities and immigrants into the suburbs, and so it's important to start teasing apart um, all of these effects. And so I specifically am looking at uh, the determinants of a joint tenure and location decision for Hispanic <coughs> families, and, and specifically I'm, I'm calling locations sort of between city and suburb. Then I'm looking at how these differ from those of white households, and, and especially we all can learn from intermarried households. And then finally, how do different Hispanic destinations affect these outcomes? So to do this, I'm using the, the most recent, at the time, uh, American Community Survey micro data. I'm using uh, Nebo and Verity's 2013 definition to city versus suburb. And after data cleaning, I end up with 89 MSAs, where I'm really going to be able to look at sort of more distinct differences between cities and suburbs. And the reason that I'm using the ACS, despite some of, some of its limitations in terms of wealth variables, et cetera, is to get really a sufficient sample size of Hispanics and of the geographic characteristics that I want to look at. Uh, next, because I'm doing this joint location tenure framework, I'm, I'm using a multinomial logit model with four possible outcomes. Urban owning, urban renting, suburban owning, and suburban renting. I'm, I'm observing this at the household level, and I'm really restricting my sample from 18 to 64 to cut off those life cycle effects that happen late in life. Finally, I'm modeling whites and Hispanics separately to allow the determinants to vary by ethnicity. So despite using this broad national definition of city versus suburb, you can see that cities and suburbs still look different from each other. Cities are more ethnic minority. They tend to, their populations tend to have lower levels of education, higher poverty rates. And then, of course, important to this study, cities have a much lower share of owner-occupied stock. And so when we look in aggregate, Hispanics and whites exhibit different spatial patterns. So whites are disproportionately urban owners. 54% of my sample are, are of whites in my sample are urban owners. 
Meanwhile, Hispanics are actually roughly evenly distributed between the urban renter, suburban renter, and suburban owner categories. You can see that actually whites and Hispanics in my sample are about equally likely to be urban owners, which means that that 25 percentage point uh, home ownership gap that I showed in the first slide is actually exclusively here a suburban ownership gap. So I'm going to move next to, to my regression models. I do not present the full models here. They're available in the paper. Um, just as a reminder, I am modeling whites and Hispanics separately. I'm going to be showing exponentiated coefficients and a quick stats reminder for everybody. Values greater than one means that my base outcome urban renting is less likely than the sh shown outcome. <coughs> Values less than one means that urban renting is more likely. I do a full set of um, controls and independent variables both at the individual level and then at the MSA level to capture some sort of morphology and housing market characteristics. So to start, the consistent with the literature, life cycle effects predict owning for all families. But in particular, they're predicting they more strongly, and in particular in suburban contexts, first uh, white families. And so as, as households get married and have children, they are more likely to become owners. But this larger effect size for whites, in particular in the suburban context, suggests to me that there are lingering barriers for Hispanics because these trigger events just aren't as strong for those households. <coughs> Uh, again, consistent with the literature, assimilation matters. So new immigrants, those who have only been here for a couple years, those who aren't citizens, those who are linguistically isolated <coughs> and no adults in the household speak English well or very well, are much more likely to be urban renters than any other outcome. But as they stay in the US for longer, they do tend to become owners. But sort of inconsistent with the literature on suburbanization, we find that long-standing uh, immigrants actually are becoming urban owners more likely than, than suburban owners. And so you can read this, I think, in, in one of two ways. Either they are choosing to remain in ethnic enclaves where they have strong social networks, or they would like to access suburban amenities, find that they can't, and decide to enter home ownership anyway, but in an urban context. And so I thought it'd be interesting to look at intermarried households to start teasing apart you know, what there, there may be effects going on that I'm not able to control for. So here, I mean, it's a sampled person, if they're white, who's married to any non-white person, and an Hispanic person who's married to any non-Hispanic person. And you see that intermarried white households are much more likely to be urban renters than any other outcome compared to white-white <laughs> households. The converse is true for Hispanics. And actually, in this, in this sample, and in true uh, typically, is that Hispanics are disproportionately married to whites when they're not married to another Hispanic partner. And so being married to a white person facilitates both ownership and suburbanization, in particular, suburban home ownership. So I think there might be a couple uh, mechanisms through which this is happening. First is, is access to family capital. So whites are more likely to be wealthy. They're more likely to receive intergenerational transfers like on payment assistance. And so having a white partner just increases the probability that you marry into a family network that can help you out with that first home purchase. It could also affect access to institutional capital. So we know that there are racial differences and ethnic differences in lending. And so again, having a white co-borrower might make it a little easier to get the mortgage or to get more favorable mortgage terms. And, and finally, I think that the last effect is going to be through knowledge networks. So the home buying process, as we heard in the previous panel, can be complicated. Um, and so again, having access to family networks and friend networks who are already homeowners, which is going to be more likely to happen for, for white households. Um, can facilitate that. And we also know that neighborhood decisions and a knowledge of neighborhoods is going to vary by race. And both that uh, intermarried households are more likely to live in ethnically diverse neighborhoods than, than intramarried households, but also that the specific neighborhoods in which a family considers moving to tend to be constrained by the race of that individual. And so again, having a white partner might broaden the set of neighborhoods that, that a Latino is looking at. Now I want to take a step beyond just the urban-suburban question and look at how racial uh, re regional settlement patterns might impact these outcomes. And here what I'm thinking about is that long-standing immigrant gateways both have more robust ethnic networks that, that Hispanics can be tapping into, both in terms of knowledge, but potentially institutions that are more likely to offer classes in Spanish or lending services in Spanish. But at the same time, these places may have a longer-standing history of segregation which means we might be seeing differences on that front. And so I divide my 89 MSAs into five different types of uh, Hispanic destinations. The baseline here are what I'm calling average Hispanic places. 
these are these have low uh, low Hispanic rates in 1990, and sort of no interesting change in the Hispanic population around this time period. New Hispanic destinations had a small share of Hispanic in 1990, and very rapid growth in the population, but not necessarily large in percentage point terms. So they may still be 7% Hispanic today, but had, that's a very large increase compared to 1990. The, the demographic shift now Hispanic bases are places that didn't have a very large Hispanic population in 1990, and today have a large percentage point change. And so these are places maybe went from being 5% Hispanic to 20% Hispanic during this 30-year period. Finally, the last two categories of the historic Hispanic bases, these had Hispanic populations that were larger than the, the national average in 1990. The historic bases saw no sort of substantial shifts in the population, sort of like average growth. And the demographic shift in these places with large percentage point change. And so they might be going from 20% Hispanic to 20, or so excuse me, 40 or 45% Hispanic over this time period. And Hispanics are disproportionately concentrated in these last two categories. About 75% of my sample lives in the last two types of locations. And you can see that, that home ownership, and in particular suburban home ownership, is much less likely for Hispanics in both of these types of locations. In historic Hispanic bases, it's actually low for everybody. And once I tell you the cities in this bucket, it's not surprising, right? It's New York City, LA, Miami. They're places with large urban cores, a history of renting, low home ownership rates overall. But given that nearly half of the Hispanics in the sample live in these places, it's going to impact the national Hispanic home ownership rate. And then in both the, the historic bases and the demographic shift bases, their Hispanics are disproportionately likely to be urban overall. And so it's just uh, we're seeing sort of different uh, urban distributions uh, at this level. And so before I move on, this is sort of, I'm, I'm ending here with, with my regression results, but I'm moving into thinking about what does this mean for policy? And so I sort of conduct two quick thought experiments um, on thinking about the wealth implications of, of the differences that I've shown thus far. The first is that Hispanics are disproportionately likely to live in high cost areas. And so again, looking at these five different types of regions, Hispanics live in, in the two where the median home prices are well above average. So it's going to be a lot more difficult for Hispanics in these markets to become homeowners in the first place. But to the extent that they can enter homeownership, they potentially face a high upside because they put a lot into the forced savings mechanism of homeownership, and with the high home prices, this may let them, let them tap sort of large uh, amounts of equity in the future. Going back to, to the city and suburban divide, I, I used Zillow data here to be able to track annual price change through the, the boom and the bust and then the recovery. Overall, whether or not the city or the suburb itself was more expensive was dependent on location. So in five of the, the 10 places I sampled, the city was more expensive than its suburbs, and in five, the reverse was true. But what was more typically true was that the change in prices was much more volatile in the city. So they experienced bigger booms, bigger busts, and a stronger recovery in the interim. So because Hispanics are disproportionately likely to be urban owners, this means that, again, they're facing a high-risk, high-reward situation. To the extent that they can become homeowners and sustain it through the bad years, they may face a really large upside. But they need to make it through the, the crash periods. The other thing I'd, I'd like to think about is that Hispanics are also disproportionately urban renters. And so during this recovery period, where we've not only seen a surge in home prices, but a surge in rents, they're the population that's most likely to be being squeezed by um, the, the increases in rents, making it both more difficult to afford rent in today and facing displacement and gentrification, but also more likely to face difficulty in saving for home ownership. So I've thrown a lot of stats at you really quickly because I'm seeing a little ahead of time. So the, the main takeaways here, I, I really want to start um, pushing back on our assumptions that go behind the fact that homeownership is suburban. We all know in this room that that's not true, but it sort of underlies a lot of the ways that we talk about homeownership and that we talk about homeownership access. And so that we need to acknowledge that in particular for certain populations, here I've shown it for Hispanics, but there's other work that, that coincides with this um, with African Americans or Asians. That, that they may not be living in the same places as white families. And so what does that mean, both for long-term policy implications and, and for equity? Uh, so then that leads to my, my second point, which is that the Hispanic white home ownership gap is really a suburban gap. If we decompose that national gap, it's all happening in the suburbs. So if we think about expanding access to home ownership for Latinos, it's not just about access period, but it's about spatially equitable access to home ownership. And finally, 
the, the life cycle effects and the intermarriage uh, differences between Hispanics and whites do suggest that there are lingering barriers to home ownership for this population. So for me, this is part of a larger project on the geography of Hispanic home ownership. I also want to look at sort of trends in suburbanization and home ownership from 1990 till now, and what sorts of neighborhoods is this more likely to be happening in tandem for Hispanics. I'm also hoping to look at what the homes and the neighborhoods of Hispanic owners look like and how those are different from those of whites. But given the group that's here, I'd be really interested in hearing other directions that you think I should move this work. But I also think that this paper brings up bigger questions for the field. I think using panel data to the extent that we can find some that allows us to, to track a large number of Hispanics, <laughs> to really look at what the wealth building or, or other benefit and cost implications of homeownership are at a geographic level rather than just sort of a big picture pros and cons. I also think there's value to doing more narrow geographic definitions. So here I've just done city and suburb because I'm restricted to the Puma observations and the public data. Those of you who have access to restricted data might be able to play around with city versus booming suburb versus busting suburb, or city versus inner ring versus outer ring, or even ethnic neighborhoods within cities, um, and whether or not we see sort of the outcomes in one direction or another. And finally, um, I've been thinking about this sort of as a trade-off between suburbanizing and, and being a homeowner, and that that's the way that these families are thinking through this decision. But I actually don't know that that's true. So I think there's a lot of value in doing qualitative work to understand decision-making from the perspective of families, especially if we're thinking about targeting programs to sort of shift the current equilibrium. So thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thanks for having me, and thanks to Rocio for um, sharing your paper with me. Um, I want to um, uh, start with giving a, a few different um, demographic facts. So I'm a demographer at, at Cornell. Um, we don't have sweaters or scarves on. We've got old doctors. And <laughs> um, so there's, there's three uh, demographic trends that really help describe the um, aspects of the Latino experience. Uh, today, and I want to really quickly highlight highlight these. So, so the first is is uh, the one that I mean, we're familiar with all of these, but the first is the fact that the Latino population is growing at a very rapid clip. Um, it is now the largest minor, minor, minority group in the country, um, and regardless of what happens with immigration policy, the Latino population is going to continue to grow. So, this is actually the Census Bureau's kind of low immigration estimate of um, or projection of of the Latino share of the population in 40 years, right? So exceeding the quarter of the, of the total population. If you look at births you know, that are happening now, right, an enormous share of births um, are to uh, Latinos. If you look in places like California, the majority of births are to um, Hispanic, um, uh, Hispanic mothers. So the population is very rapidly diversifying uh, on this dimension. The other Two related points are that the Latino population is increasingly geographically diffused. And this is a point that Rosia made in her presentation, right? that there's been this shift away from you know, the traditional destination states of California, New York, and Texas, and Florida, right, to other places. And you can see that here, that, that uh, orange share is kind of this, the, the share of the Latino population that lives outside of the, what we consider kind of the big five states. And that shift from 20, you know, 6 to 35% might not seem like an enormous shift. But in terms of demographic change, that is, that does represent a big shift because it, ha it has to represent some fundamental reorientation or fundamental shift in migration behaviors, right? And so that's either the kind of the, the settlement behaviors of new, new immigrants or what's, what's actually happening is a, is a redistrib redistributive property um, or characteristic of existing uh, Latino um, folks. And then even when you look within states or within, within cities in particular, you can see that this diffusion process is actually playing out, right? So, you know, it is true that um, Latinos are still largely urbanized and still concentrated in central cities, but, I mean, this shift here, this is so that this is maybe not the best graph, but the, the red circle there is the proportion of the, of the metropolitan Hispanic population living in the suburbs, right? So in 1980, you know, about a quarter of Latinos were in the suburbs. Today, it's close to half. Right, so there's been this geographic dispersion that's happening, 
on these on multiple spatial scales simultaneously. And then throughout all of this, of course, you have accelerating homeowner, homeownership among, the, among Latinos. They're purchasing homes right on the heels of the recession, and then there's a contraction that takes place. And this is obviously tied in to your framing in, term, in terms of wealth, wealth accumulation. Um, so you know, these demographic trends are really important for this crowd because they all affect housing behaviors um, because, because of all this mobility and growth and, um, and, and family change um, happening all simultaneously. So, so the key question in this paper is, is actually quite simple, and it's right there in the, maybe I think the first or second paragraph of the paper, and it's just where are Latinos are where Hispanics buying homes, right? And, and, and then, you know, there's all these kind of ancillary questions, but this really is the core question. Um, and this is, a, this is a really important, important question, and it's one that we actually know relatively little about. Right? You, you, know, you, you would think that we would know a lot about these kind of demographic or these descriptive orientations, Around the geographic, um, the, the geographic distribution of Latino homeownership, but we don't. And, and part of this is part of this is because of data limitations um, that I'll come back to in a minute. Um, but part of this, we're just trying to catch up with with the with the, diverse, uh, the diversification of this population and the fact that a lot of the models that we draw from, including the assimilation and the stratification perspectives, are based on an old. Um, demographic uh, profile that was largely black and white. And we're still kind of developing some of our conceptual and theoretical arguments throughout that same lens. Um, it's also, you know, the, the, the paper and the question is important because, you know, the answer to this question is about the, the geographic distribution of Latino homeownership helps us to understand the assimilation process. And as someone that spends most of my time thinking about immigration and assimilation, um, this is an important dimension through which people can, can, make, um, can make intergenerational progress and, and through, through which mobility um, exerts itself. It also, of course, helps us understand some of the constraints on locational attainment right, and on, on ownership, that is the mechanisms right, through which, those, um, through which, which ownership might, might be solved. And then it provides this kind of broader lens on, on the prospects for racial integration. Okay, so let me get into the paper. So, you know, my first overall point is, is that there's, there's really a lot here. And I think there's actually, I think my, my, you know, my key suggestion is just to really simplify the focus, right? The, the, the core question about this geographic distribution of Latino homeownership is totally sufficient, right? And there's a lot to, to unpack there. Um, and I think in doing so, you can, you can spend time more just on that, that it helps to, to kind of strengthen all aspects of the paper, right? You can have a better, stronger motivation that's better linked to some of the conceptual arguments and then better um, integrated with the analysis. And you have, you know, there's these kind of three other dimensions about intermarriage, about Latino destinations, and about um, price volatility. You know, those are probably separate papers. I think, you know, the, 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 the core question here about just that geographic uh, representation is, is, an, is an important one. So as a demographer, I would, you know, argue you should embrace the descriptive orientation, right? I think there's, you know, there's, you're, you're not going to be able to develop some, some causally identified estimate of, on how people make locational decisions. And so I think that just providing that descriptive demographic kind of breakdown of, of the distribution of, of Latino um, owners across multiple spatial scales. And of course, you're limited here by the, the data, right? You have Pumas and not, and, and, the, and that's where you're, um, you're constrained is. But I think you can take better advantage of, of some of the, the geographical features of those, um, those points. Um, you know, the, the other point that I'll, I have comments that I'll send you that will outline these in more detail, but, um, you know, I kept thinking, you know, what, what is the behavioral model, right? What, what are the conceptual arguments that are being tested here? And, you know, you have, there's these kind of this assimilation and stratification perspective, but what sort of evidence do I need to see in order to support those different models? Okay, so I think just kind of clarifying that would be helpful. Um, the other part is that, you know, there's, there, there are a few temporal dimensions that, that really could be explored further. So one of these is the is the generational process, right? That and, and again, they're limited by census data. We don't have immigrant generation, but there's ways that you can kind of uh, manipulate the data in, in, in some ways so you can get, get some sense on it. So you can at least distinguish between what we think of first generation, 1.5 generation, those that arrived as children, and, and, the, and the second plus generation. And then look at the kind of the, the ownership and locational uh, outcomes of, the, of those groups. The other question is, you know, what you're really interested in is, is in that decision process about where people are making decisions about where to live. And I think in order to do that really well, you probably want to be looking at just new buyers. Um, 
And the census data doesn't, you can't really do it there, but you can use the migration question in order to at least look at, um, it won't be first time buyers, but it'll at least be new buyers. And I think that'll give you a little bit more purchase on, on, on answering your question. And that's partly connected to my other point that you have to be a little careful with, with the way that the, um, all your covariates, your controls are discussed because a lot of them aren't gonna be temporally aligned, right? By looking at all homeowners, Right, the marital status, including intermarriage, right, may have come well after somebody moved into the suburbs or purchased a home, and so that really kind of changes the nature of the of the um, theoretical arguments you're making about those questions. Um, and then, you know, more generally, you know, you, I think there's there's a lot of heterogeneity in the Latino population that is what makes the ACS data so great to, to be able to explore, right? So, you know, not only generation, but citizenship, ethnicity, age, education, family status. I mean, legal status is another component of this that really can't be ignored, maybe not be able to be modeled, but you really also need to, to think about that as well. And then the last thing I want to say quickly is, I think there needs, there, there th this, um, in thinking about this joint decision between suburbanization or location and tenure, I think you might want to give some greater thought to spatial dependencies. And I don't mean spatial dependencies in the statistical sense, I mean more in the conceptual sense, right? That there's this kind of inertia to where people live, where they were raised. And, um, and, and I'm, I'm not sure that people really are truly making joint decisions. I think that people live in the suburbs and then make decisions about whether they're going to be owners or buyers. Um, Likewise, there, there are people in the cities that make decisions about whether to um, own or rent, regardless of, of whether they're, they're living in the city or not. Um, and so I think you just need to kind of want to work through some of that, those conceptual dynamics um, more clearly. It ends up being really consequential because there's this big kind of headline finding at the end that the gap in ownership is a suburban gap. But if you condition on urban, on urban status, it doesn't look that way, right? So if you condition on urban status, the gap basically looks to be about the same. That is, if you Take into effect, take into effect um, uh, if you control for the fact that that Latinos are much less, much more likely to live in cities, right? Then their ownership rates actually look quite as lower as any whites. Anyway, so um, I have more comments um, that, that I'll share with you later. But um, thanks again for for uh, for giving me a chance to look at the paper and, and for inviting me here. Thanks. She's more the uh, manufactured housing mobile home subject matter expert. I dabble more in Greek letters and equations, so this will be a much less in interesting presentation uh, because I'm giving it. Uh, but uh, the title really hits home with our key question uh, for this research, and that's do mobile homes affect wealth? Uh, and we're going to ask this question uh, looking at a cohort uh, of individuals from the NLSY 97. Uh, that really came of age during the mobile home boom in the United States. Uh, so here's an example of manufactured housing. Um, you'll probably hear me talk more about mobile homes than manufactured housing. There's an important distinction there. Uh, but all the survey questions that I'm using ask about mobile homes, uh, probably because individuals are more familiar with the term mobile homes. So that's what I'll use uh, in talking about the research today. Uh, and so. Uh, what, is, what does the literature say about mobile homes and affordable housing uh, generally? Well, interestingly to me, as someone who didn't study mobile homes before working with Esther on this project, about 18 million U.S. residents live in mobile homes today, and that's uh, quite a sizable portion of the population. Um, the average mobile home uh, costs less uh, than half uh, what a conventional single-family home costs per square foot. So mobile homes are quite affordable. They're uh, an important form of affordable housing in the United States. 
uh, and mobile homes provide a major source of low-income housing and low-income home ownership uh, in the United States. So mobile homes uh, comprise 66% of new affordable housing in the 1990s. That dipped a little bit uh, in the Great Recession, but it's come back some since then. Uh, and 71% of all new homes sold under $125,000 uh, were mobile homes uh, in recent decades. So mobile homes are really an important and emerging uh, component of uh, the low-income housing market. Uh, and then finally, 25% of first-time low-income home buyers bought mobile homes from 1990 uh, to 2000. Again, highlighting the sales. Um, so this uh, <coughs> here shows uh, the dramatic rise in the share of the U.S. population that lives in mobile homes from 1970 uh, to 2000. So it grew from a little over two and a half percent to six and two-thirds percent, uh, dropped off um, in 2000, uh, and then the Great Recession. Uh, it's about stable since then, but again, a sizable part of the U.S. population, about 1 in 18 Americans today, will live in mobile homes. So um, this is a non-trivial question uh, in terms of what effect mobile homes have on wealth uh, of the many Americans that live in mobile homes today. Um, today, no research has asked, that we're aware of has asked this question, uh, and there's really not much quantitative research generally uh, on the causal effects of mobile homes on inequality, social stratification, and life chances of Americans today. Um, so we're trying to uh, push the literature in that direction. Uh, race, is also, race and ethnicity are also an important part of the story here. Um, so mobile home residency generally has grown across racial and ethnic groups uh, in the last 50 years or so. Uh, here you see the growth for whites, again, uh, from 1970 to 2000, about two and a half. Uh, it's a little over 7%. Uh, blacks, the intercept's lower, but the growth trend is about the same. So fewer blacks live uh, in mobile homes and a lower share of blacks live in mobile homes than whites. Um, Hispanics, interestingly, they started out about the same place as blacks in 1970, uh, but now they're uh, more likely to live in mobile homes than a white uh, individual is to live in mobile homes. So uh, the rise in mobile home ownership is particularly salient among Hispanics and among native populations in the U.S. This is, uh, was really amazing to me. These are data from the ACS. Uh, in 1970, only about 4% of native populations lived in mobile homes. Uh, and today, uh, almost 14% of the population uh, lives in mobile homes. So uh, mobile homes are really salient among native populations. We don't have the data to study wealth effects among native populations, uh, but it's really an important consideration. Uh, and then finally, other race individuals, there's uh, again been this increase uh, and they're uh, about on par um, with, uh, let's see, that looks like uh, the, uh, I lost the line there, yeah, uh, on par with the Hispanics, yeah, that's, I think, correct. Um, no, 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 they're right there at the bottom there, uh, other race. Uh, any more difference between that's the white line and that's the other line? Um, I guess I should use color. Um, uh, so again, this just highlights uh, there's been this modest increase uh, in rate of mobile home residency among white and black residents, much larger increases among Hispanic uh, residents. Uh, now, this is an important story because research by Priel and Sasha uh, shows that housing uh, offers greater return to white individuals in the U.S., but housing is more important for non-whites wealth uh, than white wealth. So whites tend to draw uh, more wealth out of their housing, but housing makes up a greater share of wealth among non-white populations. So looking at this racial variation in mobile home effects on wealth is going to be important. Uh, so we're going to ask three research questions today. The first, again, is just our general question. Does long-term mobile home residency affect wealth? Second, is there racial and ethnic variation in, in this relationship? Uh, and then third, uh, and this will be kind of what I conclude on at the end, is does home ownership and or mobile home ownership mediate any mobile home residency effects on wealth? So like I mentioned earlier, data for this come from the LSY 97. There are not a lot of data sources with long running uh, data on mobile home residency. Um, the LSY 79, I've learned, may have it, but it's in the restricted use file. Um, it exists, so you can't get it with publicly available information. Um, 
We're using the complete panel of respondents, so individuals who responded in every wave from 97 to 2015, about half the sample, we have sampling weights that adjust uh, for attrition to account for that. Um, and that's 4,809 individuals that comprise our sample. Um, our dependent variable is gonna be household wealth in 2015, and that's top coded for the top 2% that that group's mean. Uh, because wealth is skewed and to reduce the influence of outliers, we're going to use the inverse hyperbolic sign transformation. I'm sure all the economists who aren't wearing sweaters know about the inverse hyperbolic <laughs> sign, uh, but it is basically akin to the natural log. What you see here is the uh, graph of the inverse hyperbolic sign at different values from 50, negative 50,000 to 50,000, but the IHS is defined in zero and negative values, whereas the natural log is not, and the natural log is basically just an intercept difference at essentially all values uh, from the inverse hyperbolic sign. So results to be interpretable as semi-elasticities. Uh, and our focal independent variable is going to be cumulative global home residents from 1998 to 2015. We use 97 as a baseline control year. Uh, and this is how we define cumulative global home residents. It's just the average local home residents, uh, zero, one binary variable in each year from 98 to 2015. Uh, so this is where I'm going to start talking about Greek letters uh, and have lots of equations. I'll also try and use my words as a sociologist to uh, walk through this. Um, so we're using IPT weighted marginal structural models, which are basically a fancy way of controlling for variables that vary over time, so things like income. Uh, when, if you just put those in a traditional regression control model, there would be all these terrible statistical biases that we're avoiding by using these fancy IPT weighted marginal structural models uh, that are really mouthful to talk about. It's a two step <coughs> estimator. Uh, so, in the first stage uh, of the estimates, which I'm not going to show you anything about, um, so you'll just have to trust me, uh, we estimate uh, essentially a propensity score model. The denominator is like a traditional propensity score. Uh, but we have treatment over, let me do the math, like 16 years, or 16 waves on our data. So we have 16 different treatment variables. And so we're going to construct uh, what's called a stabilized uh, weight by predicting the odds uh, that an individual lives in a mobile home at any given year, uh, conditional on whether they lived in a mobile home in the previous year, whether they lived in a mobile home at baseline, uh, a whole set of baseline controls and then contemporaneous and one year lag uh, values of controls that vary over time. So things like income. I'll give you the controls in a minute. Uh, and once we, and the numerator stabilizes the weight, um, and because baseline mobile home residents and time invariant controls are in the numerator, those will also be control variables in the treatment effect estimation equation, which predicts wealth, uh, again, in 2015, based on cumulative mobile home residents. So this beta one will be our treatment effect parameter, uh, and then controlling for time invariant controls, and these stabilized weights adjust for a variety of time variant controls. We'll also look at nonlinearity in this equation by including quadratic and cubic terms. The cubic terms don't matter, so I'm not going to present them, uh, and then racial heterogeneity in the effects. Okay, here's our list of controls, so you don't have to totally take it on faith that everything here. Uh, is endogenous and because of selection bias. Uh, so uh, some of our key time invariant controls are baseline mobile home status, so whether or not an individual lived in a mobile home in 1997, uh, their parental wealth in 1997, so we have this parent wealth measure, uh, race, ethnicity, gender, immigrant generation, foreign language, uh, spoken in the home, uh, when uh, the individual's mom first gave birth, and when, at what age, uh, gave birth to the respondent, uh, parents' education, childhood family structure, and parental home ownership. Uh, and then we have a host of time varying controls that predict differential selection over time, uh, a number of individual controls, including things like inheritances, whether or not uh, the individual received an inheritance, the value of that inheritance, uh, family size, uh, the census region, individual's age, um, then uh, family level controls, things like uh, and income to needs. Uh, ratio, uh, public assistance receipt, uh, home ownership, so whether or not uh, the family lived in a home that was owned, uh, predicting whether or not they lived in a mobile home and one year lag of that, uh, and then controls for the head of the household, things like the number of jobs, weeks worked, etc. Uh, so all this is to try and control for the fact that individuals are not randomly sorted into mobile homes, which is 
totally unsurprising to everyone in this room. Um, and our causal estimates are conditional on adjusting for selection into mobile home, and that we've adequately, adequately done it with this selection model. So to the extent that there's unobserved selection, uh, we don't have a causal estimate at all. Uh, so here is our uh, general treatment effect estimate for mobile home residents. And this would be a really sad presentation if I came here and said, look, mobile homes don't matter. Uh, I'm going to walk off the stage right now. Um, but uh, this is adjusting for everything, time invariant controls, IPP weights adjusting for time variant controls. And at a linear relationship, we don't see any significant relationship between cumulative mobile home residents uh, and wealth in 2000, or wealth uh, when an individual is age 30, actually. Uh, and because perimeter estimates are interpretable as semi elasticities, what this would suggest is that uh, for an individual who never lived in a mobile home, if they were to live in a mobile home for the entirety of the duration from 1997 to when they turned 30, their wealth would be 129% lower, which is a little strange. Uh, here, there's clearly nonlinearity going on. so. Um, there's a strong negative association between mobile home residency uh, and initial declines in wealth uh, among uh, people who live in mobile homes for just a little bit of the sample. So I plotted uh, average adjusted predicted wealth uh, based on cumulative mobile home residents uh, throughout the sample. So uh, individuals who never live in a mobile home have predicted wealth uh, up here and then even just living in mobile homes for 10% of the study window uh, yields a significant reduction in wealth. Um, again, wealth drops at 20%, and there's sort of a declining uh, negative effect afterwards here. So it's really even short-term residence in a mobile home actually matters and seems to have a plausibly causal uh, reduction in wealth accumulation by age 30. So here I will plot the just predicted wealth gap, so the first to last points uh, on the graph. So individuals who, uh, based on model two, this nonlinear model, individuals who never lived in a mobile home have predicted wealth of uh, about 180% uh, higher than individuals who lived in a mobile home for 50% of the study window. So that's, I mean, 180% more wealth, that's, uh, that's nothing to sneeze at, even at age 30 when uh, average wealth uh, of individuals in our sample is about $80,000. Uh, and wealth is uh, assets minus. <coughs> um, so our next model uh, looks at uh, racial and ethnic heterogeneity uh, here. The base category uh, is whites. I haven't presented uh, coefficients for other race individuals because they're just too small uh, to actually yield um, any uh, precise estimates for, uh, but uh, as you can see, uh, this sort of significant negative relationship between mobile homes uh, and wealth accumulation for whites uh, holds, uh, and then there's no st statistically significant difference for blacks, so blacks who never live in a mobile home have just as much wealth uh, as blacks who uh, live in a mobile home for about half the study window, uh, and then counterintuitively, uh, among Hispanics, those who never live in a mobile home have uh, non-significantly but substantively uh, much lower wealth than Hispanics who live in a mobile home for 50% of the study window. So this is a really puzzling finding for us uh, that we're going to try and chew on uh, in some subsequent research. It's not statistically significant, but I mean, the sample size of Hispanics here is somewhat small. It's uh, a little over 1,000. Uh, Hispanics in our sample, and uh, the number of Hispanics who actually live in a mobile home for an appreciable uh, time in our study is even smaller, so um, we're coming up against issues of efficiency, as you can see, with a really large standard error down there uh, around our uh, average adjusted predicted wealth among Hispanics who lived in mobile homes for half the study with us. Uh, okay, so question number three, uh, mediation by home ownership. Um, so this gets even more complicated now uh, to actually estimate a potentially causal model. We have to calculate two sets of stabilized weights. And I'm not going to walk you through this, but basically we calculate a stabilized weight for treatment and then a stabilized weight for the mediator, which 
uh, adjust for uh, cumulative treatment to some extent. Um, and then our treatment effect estimate uh, is going to be the original equation uh, plus our mediator uh, in here, which is either um, in one model is going to be general home ownership uh, from age 25 to 30, uh, and then in another model is going to be actual mobile home ownership from age 25 uh, to 30. Uh, so this is just to show you that I have regression estimates, and we actually ran the models. We didn't make up the numbers. Uh, I don't know. You hear about social scientists doing that these days. <laughs> uh, and so instead, I'm just going to give you the predicted wealth uh, for individuals uh, adjusting uh, for different uh, mediators. So here in model four, we're going to look at mobile home residence gap uh, for individuals who never owned mobile homes. And there's a significant wealth gap there. So among individuals who never owned mobile homes, if they never lived in a mobile home, they have about 235% more wealth than if they lived in a mobile home for half the study with it. So this would be uh, long-term mobile home renters, basically, or those who at least don't own a mobile home uh, toward the end of the study with it. Uh, in contrast, individuals who lived in a mobile home for 50% of the study window, but at least owned a mobile home for half the time at the end of the study, uh, had statistically indistinguishable wealth uh, from those who never lived in a mobile home. Uh, so mobile home ownership actually appears uh, to help uh, counteract the negative effect of mobile home residents. Uh, same is true of home ownership generally. So if you condition on home ownership, uh, there's statistically indistinguishable uh, differences between never living in a mobile home and living in a mobile home for half the study window. So ownership uh, appears to actually counteract the negative impact of living in a mobile home. Uh, so to wrap up, if I can, by about 45 more seconds. Uh, mobile homes are negatively associated with wealth accumulation. This is a plausibly causal relationship. We talk more about identification in the paper. Um, I'm happy to talk about it in Q&A. We'll do some sensitivity analyses. Uh, but the magnitude and the uh, errors of our estimates suggest that it is plausibly causal. Um, strongest relationship for whites, and there's this counterintuitive association among Hispanics um, that I think is really worth digging into if we can find better data on the Hispanic population. Um, and then the negative relationship is largely counteracted by mobile home ownership or home ownership generally. Uh, so our research um, sort of speaks to some of the existing research that's out there that highlights the pitfalls of this low appreciation and subprime lending on home equity for mobile home owners. Uh, but it really qualifies this conclusion uh, by showing that mobile home ownership is actually a way to counteract uh, some of the negative effects of general mobile home residency. So there's two tensions uh, that are really going on here. Um, and it's the lack of ownership or divided housing tenure uh, that may explain mobile home effects on wealth. And so we have to think carefully um, when we're incentivizing or disincentivizing uh, mobile home residency and mobile home ownership among individuals in the United States. Thanks. So uh, here is my note to congratulate the conference organizers on picking some of the topics that are not super common. Mobile homes, like it's one. Uh, land contracts. I want to congratulate the authors on also picking mobile homes as a topic. And something that is less well known is if you notice this was the only study using NLSY uh, 97. I understand it is a bear of a survey to work through the data. Uh, it happens to be housed at Ohio State, so. The one other comment is people all have images of what mobile homes are. It reminds me of Gary's comment about land contracts. So you can think about mobile homes and mobile home parks, but also think about rural Ohio, where there's a lot of rural areas that have a lot of mobile homes. Manufactured housing is, is the structure. Um, OK, so that's that. Uh, there's actually three papers here, all presented in one. So Alexander is our timekeeper. Can I have 30 minutes? <laughs> you got to ask Kathy. <laughs> Huh. Okay. So I'm only going to talk about two of the three to the extent that I have time available. I'm going to deconstruct your paper and mostly not talk about the one that we talked about here. Uh, so first one, 
if you notice, he was saying from the start of the survey to age 30. There's two spells there. There is while you are a child, adolescent, living with your parents, and then there's the post parental independence, however that's defined, period, where you're either a renter or an owner or living in a group, something like that. Those are two different research questions as to what happens when you live in a mobile home on, on that. You know, it could be, the first question is really a large multidisciplinary question about experiences as a child and as a youth on a variety of young adult outcomes. And there's a whole long list of young adult outcomes. I got a few up there, educational attainment, employment, wage rates, criminal activity, being on welfare. They've studied everything. And it is a very large literature. Psychologists, sociologists, economists have all been in there. The second one uh, is more of the regular wealth accumulation literature. It reminds me mostly of the home ownership versus renting uh, literature on wealth accumulation uh, if you own the property or compared to being a renter of, of properties. So I think those are two different questions. And so one thing I would urge is keep the separation, which you actually do have in the paper, but didn't present here because I think they are, they are much different uh, questions in terms of expectations. So on the first research question, so this is the child outcomes, you need to think about what a residence is. Okay, so there's this whole bunch of stuff that parents can be doing that affect their child outcomes. Let's set all that aside and just focus on the residence. What is a residence? Well, it's living area, you know, the size of the residence itself. Often in the literature that's been converted into a density, residential density measure, like persons per bedroom and so on. Uh, lot size, <coughs> the play area that they have, the quality of the dwelling and quality of the home environment. Location, which is amenities and disamenities, school quality, peer groups, and so on. That's all associated with your residence. Do you own or rent? There's a literature on owning and renting and affecting child outcomes. And then finally, we get down to the structure itself. So is it a single family dwelling, multifamily, or mobile home? So the, the sort of the, the pure aspect of, of, of mobile homes, I think, would just be as a structure. Now, it is clearly associated with a lot of other things. And the problem with this literature, the child outcome literature, you know, looking at the child outcomes or young adults, is that it's plagued by omitted variables. You need to have a data set that has these outcomes, the whole life experiences of children, what's happening to them then, what happens to them as a young adult, everything you want to know about their parents. Uh, put that together with needing to know everything about the residents. Those, you know, there aren't data sets to do that. They, you know, data sets, so some things are being omitted, and usually that picks up, you know, some of the included variables are going to pick up some of these omitted characteristics. Um, there is a debate, and this it mostly comes out of the own versus rent literature on child outcomes, uh, which is, so home ownership is also credited with uh, a lack of mobility and residential omitted, uh, mobility affects child outcomes. So should home ownership be credited with this lack of a mobility effect. Mm -hmm. And I'd say my answer to that is it depends upon causality. If it's just an association, eh, it doesn't get credited for it. But if homeownership, because of the high transaction cost, actually causes a lack of mobility, lack of mobility causes better child and young adult outcomes, then you could actually attribute it to it. In the paper itself, you talk about mobility and uh, living in a mobile home. Uh, so that's why that's relevant. Uh, research question two, as I mentioned, I think this is related to the home ownership versus renting question in terms of wealth accumulation. Um, what, what's the answer to that? You know, there's a debate about it. Well, we've already seen some things in, in here that depends upon the time period, depends where you're living. Columbus is not the greatest place in the world to, to, to have house price appreciation compared to many other places. Um, I am convinced by the literature that looks at house price appreciation that it is land value appreciation, not structural appreciation. If that's true, you can then think about mobile homes. Uh, a lot of mobile homes, they own the structure but don't own the land. Uh, in some cases, you do own the land, but the amount of land you own if this is in a mobile home park is very small, so you're not going to have much appreciation from that. I think the one exception that I remember vaguely from the Wall Street Journal maybe 15 years ago was there was a mobile home park in, I don't know, Malibu, something like that, overlooking the ocean. Mm -hmm. And they, could, they sold the park eventually uh, for very high amounts. Uh, data set. So NLSY 97 has some advantages. The disadvantage is you start at ages 12 up to 17, so you actually miss the early childhood experiences. 
um, as it goes on, you're going to have more outcomes. One of my questions is, wealth at age 30? Um, that, you know, what about lawyers? Uh, so they're just finishing law school. They're going to have a lot of wealth accumulation, but it's probably not going to be by age 30, especially if they've got student debt. So it seems a little bit premature to use it. There is an alternative, which is the NLSY 79, but we would treat those people as parents. So then you would know something about the parents from 79 to now. And luckily, they picked up another survey of the children, and they followed all of the children of female respondents through their childhood and into young adulthood. So you can look at the young adult outcomes for them. They actually have wealth, but again, they're pretty young, young adults, so I'm not sure that I would do that. The deal is you need mobile home data there, which the 97 does have. Uh, what do you expect empirically? I'm not quite so sure on the first research question whether mobile home as a structure would by itself have an effect on the child outcomes. The, you know, the, the things that it's associated with would, but the question is, are you causally picking up what is, what is actually the, the mobile home structure versus small land area versus small space and so on. Uh, research question two, I think, is really interesting. What happens to mobile home appreciation compared to other places if you don't own a mobile home? Uh, the, and, and the entire wealth accumulation question, because the types of loans are different, appreciation is rate is different. I think that certainly deserves a lot of study. Um, OK, I'm going to skip this one, because you had a good explanation of what the results were. Um, so I mentioned the first point here, which is about wealth at age 30. Um, <coughs> what about using the NLS Y79 and so on? Uh, I know somebody that did it, me. Uh, <laughs> we've got a working paper. So how did we get the residential characteristics? We actually paid the Center for Human Resource Research that has this place. They have all of the addresses, right? So what they did was match the addresses to the characteristics of the property. We didn't get to see any of that. They just came back with the characteristics of the property. But we know whether it's a mobile home or an apartment building and so on. We know the, si the this lot area size. We know the structural size and so on. So we could put all of these things in a child outcomes regression. We didn't look at wealth. We looked at a lot of other child outcomes. And whoops, let me go back one. So what we found very briefly was for young adult outcomes, and these are some positive ones like educational attainment and wages and some negative things, home ownership makes a difference, even controlling for these other, the other effects. Coming up with a mechanism for that is a challenge, because we are controlling for other things that usually we control for mobility, lots of parental variables, and so on. Um, there was an effect of residential density, but it occurred through childhood actually led to better cognition, better test scores, basically. And those better test scores were then associated with probably causal of better educational outcomes. And uh, they were associated with reductions in the negative uh, young child outcomes. The mobile home care uh, coefficients, they were not small. They were pretty big. But there was no statistical significance of any of them. And so you're sort of left with the dilemma. Is this because of small sample size, or what exactly was causing the lack of significance? But it was sort of the intuitive types of results that you would expect from a mobile home, uh, residing in a mobile home as a young adult. Remember, I'm talking about the first question. And I'm going to conclude with a question about uh, questions about causality. Um, I think you, we need to clarify in the paper a little bit more about sample selection. It probably changes over time. I wasn't sure if your method adjusted for the changes over time in sample selection. Perhaps it does, but I, I was less familiar with your specific methodology. I've got to give two quotes right from the paper. First one, we do not, however, claim that our parameter estimates are the true causal effects of mobile home residents of wealth on wealth. I agree. Uh, but then I would urge you to be careful in things like we conclude that mobile homes are an increasingly salient contributor to inequality <coughs> in America. That requires causality to be able to make that policy statement. And so I would be careful about the policy prescriptions that, that you're making. Slide of the last <laughs> presentation before we get to discuss a little bit of the plea. 
Uh, so I'm going to try to go through this uh, pretty quickly at a fairly high level, so I hope you'll forgive me. Uh, but I, I strongly encourage you to ask some questions in the Q&A and after and read the paper. Um, but first, I will introduce myself as a sociologist of inequality broadly, um, and in particular, uh, one who focuses on this fact, uh, which has sort of come to uh, be a central concern for a number of social scientists um, in recent years. Uh, so this is a chart showing the growth in the incarceration rate. Um, as you can see, we were pretty stable, this is within the US, uh, pretty stable for the first part of the 20th century, but starting in the early 1970s, we saw a sharp increase, uh, such that the, the size of the um, incarcerated population increased roughly fivefold in about four and a half decades. Um, as a result of the fact that the vast majority of people who are incarcerated are eventually released, uh, this growth in the incarceration rate has meant that we've also seen a really substantial growth in the size of the formerly incarcerated population. Uh, so it's a little hard to read here, uh, but the dark bar, sort of dark portion of the bar at the bottom, shows the um, size of the prison population over these years, and the light gray bar shows uh, an estimate of the size of the formerly imprisoned population. And so while we used to have a sort of stable uh, population of about one million people who had formerly been incarcerated in the U.S., uh, we're now up to about 5 million people in the U.S. population who have formerly been in prison. Um, now, if people served their time and then sort of went back to the community without too many hurdles, this would be an interesting demographic fact, but perhaps not something worthy of um, tons of research attention. Uh, but we know from both uh, legal scholars as well as social scientists that uh, folks who have formerly been incarcerated face a number of legal consequences that sort of stick with them once they come back. So this includes things like voting restrictions, occupational licensure restrictions, um, and a number of other things that I don't have time to get into now. Um, so as a result of that, as well as the fact uh, that that growth in incarceration uh, has been very unequally distributed along racial and ethnic lines in the US, uh, this has become a real area of concern for a sort of certain subset of social scientists concerned about inequality is how does this growth in incarceration and sort of uh, everything that flows from having formerly been incarcerated affect people's lives. Mm -hmm. And what we know is that in addition to the fact that this is a, a sort of social phenomenon that is concentrated amongst racial and ethnic minorities and that comes with a host of uh, what are often called these sort of legal collateral consequences, uh, it also seems to be a status that brings with it a lot of informal collateral consequences as well. So a range of studies have shown that prior incarceration uh, is subsequently linked to disadvantage <coughs> in almost every realm of life, ranging from mental health to employment, to housing stability, and even to outcomes for children. Um, now, what I'm going to talk about right now is a little bit more direct uh, consequence for the people in this room. Uh, is there, there are a handful of studies, uh, unfortunately not a ton, but some, that have considered uh, the implication of both own incarceration, but also family member incarceration and romantic partner incarceration for sort of wealth broadly. And some of these studies have looked at home ownership uh, in particular, others have just sort of considered more general asset, um, asset ownership as well as net worth. Um, and what exists so far, uh, these findings suggest that incarceration is associated with both uh, lower wealth and uh, lower probability of home ownership at the individual level, uh, but also sort of at the second hand level. So in particular, for romantic partners uh, of, of individuals who, who were um, incarcerated at some point, but also even beyond that, sort of um, cousins and, and tertiary family members, there even seems to be some relationship there uh, and there are a number of reasons why this is likely to be true that I'm happy to talk about more later that have to do with all of these sorts of costs that come along with um, either being incarcerated yourself or especially having a, a family member who's been incarcerated that you try to keep in touch with and then try to help sort of come back uh, home after. Um, in addition, there's been a really interesting paper looking at state level variation in the black-white uh, homeownership gap and, and investigating the role of state-level differences in the incarceration rate uh, that provides some pretty compelling evidence that, um, that incarceration is uh, in some ways contributing to black-white homeownership gaps, uh, particularly because, as I showed you, incarceration is very unequally distributed by race. 
Um, now there's also, um, from what I showed you on the previous slide, there, there, these studies don't really talk about wealth per se, uh, but the previous work on sort of the effects of uh, incarceration for subsequent outcomes also give us reason to believe that in addition to these um, what appear to be direct effects of incarceration up on the top portion, there are also uh, sort of indirect effects. So uh, to the extent that having been incarcerated affects your ability to gain employment, your hourly wage, uh, your ability to maintain employment, all of these things, that is going to uh, presumably sort of factor into your wealth levels later on down the line. Um, and in addition, I want to draw your attention to uh, this um, notion of financial sanctions, which uh, I'm not sure how familiar this will be to people uh, who are primarily in the homeownership area, uh, but this is, um, this is sort of a term of art used to uh, refer to the broad variety of fines and fees that come along with um, almost any level of criminal justice system interaction. And so this includes uh, fees you pay to public defenders, who FYI are not actually free, even though that's often the assumption. Uh, also fees paid to parole officers and probation officers uh, for each meeting, uh, as well as a number of other um, sometimes sort of financial restitution that is um, the sentence you receive for a certain uh, crime, et cetera. Um, and so these sorts of things are likely to understandably affect uh, both your and your family members' financial resources at any point in time. And especially, I think, uh, this idea of financial sanctions is important to recall, as, uh, or to think about as we recall that conversation we had yesterday about sort of these small, uh, the, the number of families that can weather sort of a small, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Expense, shock, yes, shock. Um, and these are the sort of shock that can really be um, troublesome for a lot of families. Um, but uh, another reason I want to draw your attention to these um, <coughs> indirect effects is because uh, these are things that are likely to pertain not just to individuals who have been incarcerated, uh, but to the broad variety <coughs> of uh, folks who come into contact with the criminal justice system, but who um, primarily for data reasons uh, have largely been sort of understudied in this literature so far. Um, so what I showed you before is really just this top portion of uh, the population or the rate uh, of incarceration <coughs> in prisons and jails. Uh, and this, the like, daily estimates are that basically 2.2 million people are incarcerated in the US on any given day. Uh, but another 4.5 million people are under some form of what's called community supervision on any given day. Uh, so this is probation, uh, which is served after, or sorry, probation, which is served in lieu of a custodial sentence or parole, which is a community supervision after a custodial sentence. Um, and in addition to this, I don't have a, like a fancy way to show it to you, thanks. Uh, but, uh, uh, so there's 4.5 million people under community supervision um, uh, on any given day, but there are also, the FBI estimates that in every year, uh, about 10.6 million unique individuals are arrested. And so even if you were arrested, uh, but not eventually um, even charged uh, or especially convicted, um, even that arrest can come with a disruption uh, in your daily life. It means that you might have to go to a court, uh, court uh, date or hearings, and that can mean you can't make your shift at work. Um, in addition, you're, you're going to face these financial sanctions that I was talking about before. Um, now, there's been very little research to date on what these lower level interactions with the justice system actually mean uh, for people. But the very little bit that exists uh, suggests that even arrest itself, whether or not it, it um, results in any sort of more serious outcome, even arrest appears to be disruptive uh, to the extent that uh, job applicants who indicate a misdemeanor arrest are less likely to get callbacks for jobs. Um, in addition, some work suggests that uh, arrest itself without anything else um, can be disrupted for high school completion uh, and, and also promotes uh, mental health problems. Um, and then finally, in, in work that I've been doing of late, um, I find that felony conviction without incarceration, which is actually a pretty big category that people don't realize, a lot of people end up with felony convictions but don't actually serve any time, um, that status appears to be disruptive for housing stability as well. So. What I am looking at today uh, to sort of go along with our theme uh, is how these varying forms of criminal justice contact at all levels uh, appear to relate to homeownership experiences. 
So as I showed you before, we know a little bit about what incarceration seems to mean for homeownership, uh, but I want to sort of walk through these other lower level uh, experiences and see if there's a relationship there. So I, too, am using the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth 1997 data. Uh, my thanks to Brian for introducing it. Uh, I won't spend too much time going over it. Um, but it started in 1997 with a panel of um, adolescents, 12 to 16 years old. The most recently released survey year is 2015, uh, when this panel, this cohort, is now in their early 30s, so 30 to 36 years old. So they are relatively young, and I will freely acknowledge that. Uh, but a thing that is really great and useful about the NLSY 97 data from my perspective is that as not nationally longitudinal, nationally representative and longitudinal surveys go, uh, it's got much more information on criminal justice system interaction than anything else out there. So it means that uh, we can look at every arrest, uh, charge, conviction, and incarceration spell uh, starting at age 12. With the caveat that these are self-reported and you know everything that goes along with using self-reported data, but that's true of every survey. Um, but they go to um, pretty great lengths to try to ensure that people are comfortable answering questions. And again, this is the best thing going, so uh, this is what I'll use. Um, so I just want to show you briefly what the distribution of criminal justice system contact looks like in this data set uh, and for this panel. Uh, so by age 33, uh, roughly 10% of the NLSY 97 respondents, uh, of whom there are just under uh, 9,000, um, had ever been incarcerated. So this could be um, two nights in jail, or this could be two years. Uh, it's just incarceration generally. Um, then roughly 20% had ever been convicted of a crime. Um, up to about 30% ever charged with a crime, but not necessarily convicted. Uh, and then finally, uh, roughly 40% of the entire sample um, has ever been arrested by their early 30s. Uh, so this is pretty substantial. Um, and as you might expect, based on what I showed you earlier, this is not uh, evenly uh, distributed but across racial categories. So mirroring uh, the rise in incarceration rates and how that uh, split out by race that I showed you earlier within the sample, we also see that black sample members uh, report higher, higher rates of incarceration uh, than Hispanic or white sample members. Uh, the same is true for arrest as well. So roughly 40% of the black respondents in the NLSY 97 have ever been arrested by their early 30s, uh, compared to about 34% of white respondents. All right, so um, now I'm going to jump to the outcomes I'm considering now. Thank you. And I'm going to rush through. Uh, so first, I'm just looking at current homeownership. This is a, this is a pooled model looking across all years. Uh, next, I estimate age at first homeownership amongst respondents uh, who are ever observed to own a home uh, in this, these first waves of the survey that I have access to. Uh, and then finally, to total years of homeownership uh, to date, conditional on age at first entry into homeownership. Um, what I'm going to do is run a series of models that all acknowledge the fact that uh, criminal justice contact as well as homeownership are not randomly distributed in the population. Uh, so in the first model, uh, I'm sort of mirroring uh, work that's been done before and just controlling for a range of, uh, of both predictive and uh, sort of mediating variables that we think might matter, uh, but only looking at incarceration as the sort of dependent variable of interest. And in the second model, I add these other forms of criminal justice contact just to get a sense of how much that sort of incarceration coefficient in previous work may have been picking up the sort of independent relationship between lower level uh, contact with the criminal justice system and various outcomes. Um, next, I run a difference and differences model where I'm controlling uh, or I'm comparing basically, uh, I'm just going to circle back to that. Hopefully, most of you know what difference and differences is. For the sake of time, I'll skip it. Uh, then I run a fixed effects model, um, and I will talk about these more in QA if you want. Uh, so control variables, also going to skim right by it, but it's all in the paper along with justification, so I hope you'll read it. Um, and now I'll just jump to results. So first off, I want to, is this it? Highlight? Okay. So this green bar here is from a first sort of, we could call a naive model that only includes incarceration, uh, as well as the control variables that I've incorporated in the model. 
Um, and so this is you know, meant to replicate previous work, but you see that once uh, in the yellow model, I incorporate other forms of criminal justice contact, the size of that coefficient drops roughly by half, and it appears that part of the relationship between uh, lower probability of owning your home in any given year and incarceration really might have to do uh, with uh, what happens, the association between arrest independent of these other things and conviction independent of these other things in home ownership. Um, one thing I should note, these are not mutually exclusive categories. So for anybody who's been incarcerated or has a one on incarceration, they are also should have a one on conviction, charge, and arrest. Uh, maybe not arrest. Anyway, it's a whole other issue. I'm going to speed through. I'm like out of time. Um, all right. So uh, basically, I'm, I'm seeing that uh, conviction somewhat, but also arrest, uh, seems to be related uh, both to lower probability of homeownership, later entry into homeownership, uh, even amongst this admittedly young sample, um, and then a lower, unsurprisingly, given those two things, uh, a shorter duration of homeownership um, in the, these years that I'm observing. Um, across all of these, conviction is, is uh, related, but arrest uh, and incarceration seem to be where a lot of uh, the action is. Um, but the sort of main takeaway, the thing I want to highlight here is that uh, this is not just an incarceration story. Uh, incarceration is a highly disruptive event. It means that you are not only out of your home, you're out of the labor market, you also face all of these legal sanctions. Um, but these other things that are much less disruptive also seem to have significant relationships with these homeownership outcomes as well. And so I think it's really important to note that uh, it's not just about this, um, this like small but extreme category of people in the US who've been incarcerated. Uh, this is also about the millions of people who have other uh, sort of lower level forms of criminal justice contact. And I didn't put it up there, uh, but the best estimate going is there are about 12 million Americans who have a felony conviction on their record but have never been incarcerated. You can add that on to the 5 million who've been incarcerated, and then the, there's no good estimates of it, but the millions and millions of additional adults who've been arrested at some point. And this is likely to sort of add up to a lot of, uh, it's a lot of people affected in some way, and presumably it is factoring into a lot of the black-white disparities that we see. Um, in models that have not shown, I don't see racial differences in the relationship between criminal justice contact and these outcomes, but the fact that criminal justice contact, all levels of it, is so disproportionately distributed means that this is going to have disparate impact uh, on homeownership for non-white and especially black Americans. Um, and presumably by later life that, that could and likely really will factor into uh, meaningful differences in wealth accumulation between blacks and whites just because of this additional hurdle that uh, so many individuals are facing that appears to be related to their homeownership. And now I'm out of time. So thanks very much. Thank you. Go ahead and say hi. I'm Lauren Lindy Hansen of the Philadelphia Fed. So of course I have the standard Fed disclaimer. And another more important perhaps disclaimer is that I have never worked with this data. The initial um, chosen discussant I, I think has much more experience. So I apologize to Brielle and to all of you for that. But I'm hoping that um, being sort of naive about this data, maybe I can point out what a typical reader um, who hasn't worked with the data might be asking that some of those of you who, who know the data better um, m m might just know in that. And not get to mention. All right, so what does this paper do? Brielle did an awesome job motivating it and telling you about it. But um, really, the objective here is to determine the relative impacts of arrest, criminal charges, conviction, and incarceration on homeownership experiences. So the two critical research questions here are, does criminal justice contact affect the age at which consumers become homeowners? And does it affect the sustainability or the length of that homeownership? She motivated it well, so I'm not going to tell you more about that or the data, which she did a great job. Okay, so what does this paper contribute? I think it really complements the existing literature that shows that those who are incarcerated have worse <coughs> ownership outcomes, and um, and but she, she makes some nice some nice new contributions. She's using consumer level microdata. She's um, 
she's, she has a, 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 I think arguably it's sort of a more interesting time period that she's studying than prior work because her time period uh, tra transcends the housing boom, bust, and recovery, which she's not currently doing a whole lot with and maybe not for this paper, but for the future, especially as this cohort ages, there may be some interesting applications there. She also segments the criminal justice system contact into finer, more exhaustive bins, right? So rather than looking just at the ever incarcerated sort of dummy that others are including in it and attributing all of the negative, um, uh, all the negative impacts of the criminal justice um, contact with that incarceration, she's looking at these other things, which lets her also get at people who experience the earlier and less severe forms of contact, which is cool. All right. Uh, she, she, you know, told you uh, a lot. I don't really need to explain this chart now. Thank you. <laughs> um, but, but basically, the idea is that a lot of people have had, have had contact with the justice system, and if we don't have jobs and housing, the risks of recidivism may be higher, right? So we have a, a lot of reason to care about this research. And it's going to be harder to get a job, or at least rental housing, if you have a criminal record. And eventually, that's going to have spillover effects on your ability to become a homeowner or to sustain that homeownership. Uh, she didn't touch on this. Uh, I don't think she had enough time. But really, this is this is incredibly policy relevant right now. So we, I, I was very excited to learn um, that Pennsylvania, my state, uh, had is sort of forging the way in this. Last year, we passed the Clean Slate Law, which basically automatically um, expunges certain types of criminal um, history from one's record, um, which could be could be beneficial to those um, seeking jobs and housing. And other states and municipal municipalities are actively considering similar legislation. And so, understanding better uh, the, the damage that having an arrest, let's say, on one's record causes, could could, could really inform what this legislation could do for people. <coughs> And, and you know, I think it's worth noting that this cohort, essentially millennials, uh, that, that she's studying, they're having a particularly challenging time becoming homeowners, right? Um, we see that homeownership rates are falling as they enter homeownership age. We know from work that Lori and her team have done that um, mortgage credit availability is not particularly good for people who are entering homeowner homeownership years at this time. And so this does beg the question, are these papers results going to be generalizable to better times of becoming a homeowner? And I think, I think arguably yes, but it's probably worth some acknowledgment. Okay, so now so some suggestions. And this is where you're going to learn how little I know about this data set. Okay, so the survey participation overall that, that, that Brielle reports, it seems pretty high, but it's not perfect. And the dependent variable, home ownership, isn't collected in every year. And I think we need some sort of colorful visualization to show us for each wave of the survey and each um, cohort, how, what percentage of people are even answering this question, right? Because that's going to impact um, how, how we do this book, especially given um, the things I mentioned on the previous slide. And, uh, and, I, and I'm particularly wondering, if someone is incarcerated at the time of the survey, are they going to be filling it out? And if not, what does that do to how we interpret these results? Okay. Also, um, I, I was really struck by some of the discrepancies <coughs> in this sample. And I know you're doing population, um, you're applying the population weights. But I still thought that some of these things um, were particularly interesting. I was stunned by um, just, just how high the percentage was of people who had been arrested. Yeah. When, I, when I, I thought that seems way too high, but then everywhere, every um, study I, I, I found was coming up with things extremely consistent with your results, but they're all based on the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth. So it makes me wonder how representative really is this sample, and do we need to provide some caveats? One thing in particular that I found uh, hard to reconcile is this idea of uh, the percentage of the population that's owned a home um, by age. And so in this sample, 20% of people had already owned a home or were reporting that they were homeowners, not living with a homeowner, but they were homeowners as of age 18. And that seems really high. And also the, the number by 33, uh, almost 80% of the sample being homeowners seems, um, seems pretty high, I think, given any of the charts that anyone has shown the last couple of days. OK, so I, I would like to know a little bit more about um, you know, do, are, are, do we have a great deal of confidence in how people are answering these questions? Are there other variables in the data that we could kind of use to just bolster the argument that, yes, these, these are plausible, um, these really are plausibly homeowners? Okay. Um, 
I think that, yeah, that, there, that there's a possibility to have a, a simpler, more elegant um, analytical framework. I think that uh, because the data are collected annually, it's hard to disentangle the effects of events or to understand how effects persist over time. But that's kind of critical, right, to understanding how incarceration and these lesser forms of criminal justice contact are, in, are impacting home ownership. I think um, one thing that could be done is to focus just on two two elements, the impact of ever becoming a homeowner, just estimating a discrete time hazard model might provide um, both more statistical power and also um, a more flexible functional form for, um, for examining the timing of these different kinds of events. And um, similarly, for staying a homeowner, uh, a discrete time survival model um, might just be a little bit simpler and, and easier to explain. Okay. Um, <laughs> And um, I think Brianna's done a lot more work than what she had time to show you today in the presentation. But also, um, she she mentions toward the end of the paper that she's done some work that didn't make it in that I think that I think could be really helpful to see. So the causality here is pretty hard to determine. I think she she walks a very careful line in the paper about you know trying not to make causal claims. And <laughs> we know that if there are unobserved time varying influences, they're going to confound the relationship between criminal justice. Contact and home ownership outcomes, and, and we could even have reverse causality, right? If if making a home if making someone a homeowner gives them more stability, it may be less likely than that they commit a crime, right, and have these criminal justice um, impacts. So, um, kudos to you for being really careful about how you describe it. And um, but I think that what we can do in the absence of this ability to make clean causal claims is to to cut the data a little more to help persuade the readers about what's going on in the sample, um, presenting the results of, of white versus minority homeowners, um, maybe talking about um, repeat offenses or the types of crimes involved um, could be really useful and just providing additional color, even though we probably aren't going to be able to say, um, to make very causal claims here. Okay, so thank you for inviting me to discuss this paper. I found it really interesting and obviously it's, it's, it's hugely relevant right now. questions and see um, where we are on time. sibs in the data set. Sampling is all, it's, they go to the household and they grab everyone who's 12, 16 years old. So you have sibs. Sibs allow you to do two things. One is you can uh, have family fixed effects and basically sweep out common backgrounds and look at differences in home ownership outcomes for sibs that were incarcerated and weren't. They'd be especially powerful uh, uh, sibs of the same sex. Um, and uh, the other piece it allows you to do is, if you're really worried about spillovers across family members, it allows you to directly test that. So that would actually be it's, it's something you might want to think about going forward. On the second paper, you know, if you want to look at, at the impact of mobile homes uh, on wealth accumulation, you might also go to the opposite end of the light course, because when we pick up people in the HRS at age 50, they do ask about mobile home ownership. Uh, and it is, they, they ask the questions that, Don, that uh, Don was talking about, whether you own the land or not, do you own the structure, do you own the land, do you own the land and structure. And with the detailed geocode information, you could actually really look at Don's hypothesis that a lot of this is just land values and not structure values. So there's some opportunities there, I think, as well. Great. I'm going to, you guys can collect comments, and if there's an open piece at the end, I'll do that. Jeff? So um, Don and Lauren as well are economists, and I'm an economist. And not surprisingly, they talked about causality. There's a reason why we're the dismal science. Um, uh, we're in Harvard and home of the Quarterly Journal of Economics. And as I say, to get into the People's Republic of Cambridge, you don't show your passport, you have to show your exogenous variation. 
So where's your exogenous variation that might allow you to say something about causality in terms of being a mobile home residence? And the other thing is, what's the mechanism, right? What is it about owning or living in a, a, a mobile home that might cause a difference in wealth versus being in some other um, tenure state? Um, one other point, and I found this out when I had my paper on uh, low income home ownership and wealth accumulation, is uh, using percentage of wealth, you can get huge percentage increases when you start from a very low base, right? And I, you know, I found 800% increases in wealth for some low income owners, but if you start with a thousand bucks, you know, what's 8,000 on top of that? So. Uh, you might try to do the, the model with levels of wealth as well as logs of wealth to see how that works out. To help with not having you run around everywhere, I'm going to go to Doug next, and then we'll go around the room. That way we can at least have the microphone going literally. Okay. But you have two mics. Oh, we do. Thank you. Uh, great, thank you. Thank you, uh, all of you. I have two quick questions, uh, or two quick comments. One on mobile and manufactured housing. One question, or one thought, or one comment would be, one of the reasons I think, and this is just from our experience and what we do, about the park question is really important, because that is a different experience than owned land. And so that's one thing. But one of the, one of the reasons why your wealth may be impaired, and the development may be impaired, is because of the services or the lack of services that are often available in those communities. It could be education, health, recreation, job training, transportation, all these, because of zoning and land use, these places are often isolated. And these are active policy questions that have to be addressed. And even mobile homes, I mean, even manufactured homes are excluded in many places from single family zoning, uh, even if they are owned land, and, you know, classic fee simple. They, they are also prohibited, so that's an issue too, so that's a big question. So I'd like to, you know, we should think about that. And then on the criminal justice thing, I think this is fascinating. I really appreciate uh, that study. But a couple questions. One is the expungement question is really interesting because it was just a, a study just came out that people who have the records expunged have a 20% more uh, increase in salary. That's a really, and that does, that could impact home ownership in the future. So that's one that we, you know, as Lauren mentioned, we, that would be great to track that. I also think an emerging problem in this in the criminal justice system is the explosion of women who are incarcerated. It would be interesting to break that out because a lot of these women are often the heads of household. It would be interesting to see how that population fares in the you know, in coming years. I mean, I think that's actually going to be quite uh, you know, disheartening. So thank you though, for doing that. Don? Um, for Brielle, um, is there anything about the search for home ownership or mortgage process where um, arrests or convictions come in is a mechanism <laughs> for uh, indicating it would be more difficult to become a homeowner. And the second question is, does the NLSY 97 have some type of a behavioral problems index for young people? And did you control for that? Because one could imagine it's behavioral problems that are related to the home ownership outcome, not, you know, whether you get convicted depends upon whether you get caught and so on. Um, if you want to answer as we had, oh, if you have anything burning to you want to respond to? I don't want to. Sure, I will say, oh, I don't think this is working, so I'll just speak. Um, so I have used the, the sibling, uh, fact that there's siblings and also I've heard different paper looking at housing and stability. Um, yeah, it's powerful and I haven't had a chance to apply it to this paper yet. Um, it do find significant um, effects, well, sorry, relationships uh, between uh, felony conviction without incarceration and um, housing instability broadly, uh, even within sibling pairs, but I haven't had a chance to look here yet and, and I absolutely will. Uh, behavioral controls, I have run models using um, best behavioral controls that are in there, which unfortunately they stop collecting at age 24. So I can use uh, sort of early adulthood, late adolescent behavioral controls, and I've, I've run those models too, and I find that it's um, the results are com uh, comparable to what I presented here, which is just using the, the best they have, which is just three measures of drug use and gun carrying, basically, that they collected in every year. Uh, but, but yeah, I'm thinking about that because that's the sort of biggest uh, potential confounder, really, of this population. 
I mean, I'll just say that uh, on exogenous variation, yeah, it's not, I mean, it's not an actual experiment. Um, there's not really a great way, I think, with exit theta to do an actual experiment. So um, it's a control design that attempts to create a weighted pseudo population where treatment's unconfounded with observed covariates, and we have to trust that the observed covariates adequately model selection and global home residency. I think the magnitude of the relationships coupled with um, the small error uh, and the gap, um, looking at the omitted variable bias formula to try to tease out a sense, um, suggests that it's plausibly causal in a relationship sense, but the estimated parameter by no means am I claiming that is a treatment effect parameter. Um, I, I think, you know, that's kind of the best we can do right now in terms of the social science of mobile home effects. You, you, you would want an instrument of some kind, right? Maybe why it's easier to reside in mobile homes from one state versus another or something like that. It yeah. doesn't look like you're exploiting the geographic variation. Yeah, that might, that that might be. be. Yeah, yeah um, right. but, I mean, wealth and home values are also geographically highly variable. So. Yeah. What geographic information do you have? Yeah. Because I was thinking of like things like decriminal decriminalization of marijuana being like something in Philadelphia where we see people are going to be arrested less, right, as a result. Or that's been the argument. So do you have? So you can uh, apply for. I've, I've currently got an application in for the geocoded data that you can use at your own institution rather than going to a secure data center. Uh, and this will apply to Brian as well. All that you can get there is the, the county, uh, right, MSA? No. Yeah, yeah, county, county level. County. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, you know, so you can factor in things like that for things that Brian might be interested in. It's, if you want, like, tracked, uh, the actual census tract, things like that, I can uh, jump through more hoops. Mm. Okay, I'm going to move us over to the last two questions. David Lubar from the Joint Center. This is for Rosario. Um, and and it's, it's three very, very quick ones. One is, and you may have said this and I missed it, but what happens if you control for income, right? Um, right. Uh, it's in the full controls. It just, the uh, effect sizes aren't super. So income's slightly more important for home ownership and for sperm donation for Latinos than, than it was for whites, but they were relatively comparable relationships. So I just didn't show it. Okay. Um, and, and then I was just curious what you knew about the kinds of suburbs where you were seeing, you were seeing the growth. And again, it wasn't clear that you could get into that in the data. And, and then the third, which was related to that, is um, I was thinking about Ingrid Gould Ellen's research from, what, 20 years ago on if, if different people define diversity differently. So were you seeing any evidence of certain, certain neighborhoods sort of taking off because uh, whites' definition of diversity tended to be much lower in terms of percent than, than others? Right. No. So, oh, sorry. Uh, I haven't, that's, uh, that's part of this, the narrowing in a, a better suburbanization question is part of, um, I think, my next project, which is actually looking at using tracks data. So I won't be able to do the sort of controls on individual households, but saying which type of places result in more of one or the other. Um, because here, using the Puma data, I already had to throw out MSAs where I couldn't identify even the center city versus the suburb because the center city is too small. Um, and other places had only one or two suburban Pumas in them. So it was really restricted to what I was able to say about the suburbs, but yeah, definitely areas of interest moving forward. Um, I'm going to take the sponsor's uh, prerogative of asking everybody uh, something <laughs> and maybe making some comments along the way. So for uh, Rocio, um, do you have any ability to unpack the different uh, types of Hispanic groups? Um, because I would think, you know, we often hear the Hispanic community is not a monolith by any means, and I wonder if you get some different patterns, if you could. Right, so I think actually I do have the sample size to do it. Um, I've actually made an active choice not to, in part because I've seen research that does disaggregate, but I haven't seen anybody make a compelling argument as to why we expect these differences to remain from country of origin after we control for socioeconomic status, education, all these other things. Um, and so I'm just a little bit hesitant about being, making it potentially a cultural argument. Um, and I just, so I just haven't seen sort of a compelling, like, why do we expect these differences to be there? But you're right that I think there are probably different experiences and that maybe it is worth exploring. Okay, and, and for uh, 
Brian, um, I'll just say that you know Fannie Mae is very interested in the manufactured housing space, and I would direct you to a paper that uh, our regulators put out recently that argues that uh, uh, for uh, uh, manufactured housing on fee simple owned land, the price appreciation rates are essentially indistinguishable from stick built housing. So that's something you might want to look at. Um, I do agree with Don that I think it's mainly a matter of land ownership. And it's not clear to me that you, I don't even know when you say owning a manufactured house, housing unit, what that means in this context. So uh, I don't know if you want to react to that comment. Sure, so in the NLSY, uh, 97, they don't do a great job of disaggregating, um, but basically everyone who owns, owns the home itself, the house, uh, some of them then also own the land, but it's really tough to you can't tell. get uh, the difference there. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, um, and then finally, on the criminal justice topic, uh, I noticed the, the, the negative numbers were very small for the category charged. So is the way to think about that if you're charged but you get off, it has almost no effect or? Uh, no effect uh, beyond the, to the extent we're comfortable calling it an effect, beyond the effect of arrest. So it seems to be the arrest that's sort of where things are happening and being charged or not on top of being arrested doesn't seem to, um, not much seems to be happening. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yes, it's kind of, you could be a little afraid to put up there, be the person who keeps us. Oh, we've got one, our last question, and then anyone else who wants to come up, and if you, if uh, the panelists are still there, we can discuss. Jay. Oh yeah, so this is really, uh, I guess in reaction to what Don kind of said about um, possibly there being uh, problems in the mortgage lending process with incarceration. I'm not aware of it. I can speak for all products, but I'm not aware of anything like that. But what is an issue is uh, when you don't have two years of work history. In a lot of programs, you're not going to be able to count that income uh, towards your uh, underwriting ratio, so now you can't use that income to buy your house. And maybe that's... Maybe we're bringing the, the cart before the horse when we say, like, why can't these people buy out the well, it's because they don't have the income, right? Uh, yeah, I think it's probably uh, stuff that's just really hard for me to capture. Um, but that's but that's not applying to the people who have an arrest uh, or a conviction without incarceration because they, um, their work history might be a little bit destabilized and that some folks might lose their jobs if they have to miss work shifts or court dates. But if you're not incarcerated, it is not as nearly as disruptive to your work history. Um, and so the fact that there's something going on there, um, I'm still trying to figure out what the connection is. Uh, with regard to the rental housing market, it makes total sense to me. With regard to home ownership, this is a new area for me, so I'm eager to hear uh, the potential mechanisms that, that occur to people. And so that, that could be useful. Yeah, thank you. Anna, did you want to have a last word? Oh, God. Oh, yeah, no. but, but you you're can't. very intimidating me. But just, to just to respond to what you just said, Brielle, I wonder if there's just a, a general like spillover chilling effect for people who know that having a history is going to affect their prospects of renting. And so they think, oh, home ownership is more of a reach for me than renting. And so if I can't rent, I definitely can't buy. Uh, I, yeah, I think it's possible. I think part of what's going on is that people uh, decide to or sort of become secondary household members, just realizing that they have a problematic sort of biography, uh, and so I think that's a big part of what's going on, is people just aren't trying to establish their own household in the same way. But I can't fully unpack that here, but yeah. Um, I, I kind of hate to, to call this to a close, but I think we have to. We did promise we would end our early. Um, please first join me in thanking this last panel. <laughs> It's never easy to be the last one, uh, late on a Friday, and uh, I think you all gave us a really good reason to stay, and I'm, and I'm really appreciative of all of you who stayed. Um, we have set up time to wrap up.
Uh, I'm going to take Ray Boucher's comment from the beginning and say, in Iraq, it's complicated. Um, <laughs> you know, I think uh, the fundamental issue is that housing is, uh, as, as Roberto Kersky said, you have to live somewhere. It's a fundamental need. And then it's also the biggest item in your budget. And so that's the reason why we're here is because housing has both the opportunity and the need to be a source of financial stability. Uh, Brian, I think, started off by, by asking this question about whether or not there's ways to get the benefits from renting uh, that we think of as being part of ownership. We didn't really wrestle that enough. I think that's a question going forward. But um, no, I think to wrap, what I would say is, um, the, the, you know, as, as Jeff tried to put a, a theme together for his panel, Catherine didn't even try because it was hard. But I think <laughs> the issue really was, I think, as I said, the answer, we did a call for papers. And we got a very diverse set of papers. So I, I think I can pretty much guarantee that no matter how much we came into this room, knowing I mean, an expert in the subject area, there are several papers here that gave you new ways of thinking and new insights. Um, and so I really want to thank the authors for what I really, I think, a very interesting set of papers, a lot of uh, really stimulating a lot of, uh, of thought for us. I want to thank the discussants, too. I really, I thought the discussants were, as a group, excellent. Um, and really, kind of not just commented on the papers, but actually framed it, brought it to a higher level. I learned a lot from the discussants as well. And also, um, the, the moderators, I think, did a fabulous job. And what's often a thankless job. <laughs> and, and, and Kathy, as, as a representative for all of the moderators, I mean, thank you as well. And thank you all, because I think when we do these symposiums, we're really trying to do is to gather a group of people um, who are thoughtful and, and can bring a lot to the table. And I think we had a really rich set of questions and comments and discussions. And so thank you all, and thank you all for sticking around so long. Um, just one, one commercial is that the papers are intended to be published as part of a special edition of Seedscape. Thank you to Mark Schroeder from HUD, who has uh, uh, graciously provided that platform for us. So we will be working with Mark over the course of the summer to curate the papers and get them uh, edited for publication. And they'll also appear by this fall on the Joint Center website. So uh, look, look for those to become more publicly available soon. A um, few more thank yous. First, uh, to the Joint Center staff, Carrie Donahue, who's Associate Director of Communications. Carrie, raise your hand, who's been sitting there in the back. Uh, Carrie manages the team of people who, who put on events at the Joint Center. I'm extremely proud to be part of this because I think they do such an incredible job of thinking through all the details and making it look so effortless. James Chakas, who was outside, has done a lot of the legwork. Angela Flynn, who's helped out a, a great deal. Uh, we also had Alex Herman with the Airbnb Brittany, who were fabulous timekeepers. Sean, who's been doing the mic running, along with Abby Will. Um, and David Lubrov, who's in the back of the deputy director. So uh, that's all the Joint Center staff I'm really proud to be part of. Um, and last, and, and not least, I think, I, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that the reason why we are here um, is because of uh, Fannie Mae. And so, Jackie, who was instrumental in, in the, like, the connection with Kristen. And I just want to call out both Kristen and Jackie, too, I think, for um, the other thing I'd point about, the, not just the topics, but the disciplines that we had represented here today. Um, we had uh, we had certain inner share economists. And, and <laughs> More than our share, I'm sure. <laughs> and, and sociologists, but we had demographers, we had anthropologists, we had urban planners, public policy folks. And so I think that the, the nature of this, this topic is complicated. Um, but it also required that kind of multidisciplinary view, and so we got that. And I think Jackie and Kristen were really instrumental in pushing us to have not just uh, one, one perspective on this issue. So thank you both, and, and Michael, who really uh, helped make this come to fruition. So please join me in thanking Fannie Mae. And, and, and John and Levitt, from, from the Joint Center's point of view, uh, as already pointed out. John, did I miss anything? Or Michael? Jackie? All right, so, and so that's it. With that, we're concluded. We have the space, so if you want to stick around talking to the authors, talking to each other, thank you all. Uh, hope to see you again.